Hello everyone, my name is Shireen Nariman. I'm a human rights and women rights activist. I'm a former political prisoner uh, in Iran from 1980 to 1982. And I have been living in America for past 34 years. I'm Iranian American. I'm a mother of two. And uh, I have decided to make these videos, uh, and this is the first of a uh, series that uh, I'm making, to talk about uh, my time in prison in Iran. Although it was so many years ago, but I have a strong feeling that I want to make sure my story and my friends' stories, my cellmates' stories, and those that I start knowing them in prison, I met them in prison, but they became, we became friends and then I lost them. I want to make sure that their story is told. I want uh, for the history to remember uh, and uh, young, uh, this new generation, millennials and new generation and generations to come, to know that uh, there was a... Uh, there were many people who mm, fought for freedom and democracy in Iran. Um, we did have the uh, revolution in 1979, but very soon everything uh, was, uh, it turned uh, drastically and many of us in my generation, uh, we were, um, we stood up to Khomeini who is, uh, who was a most uh, dictator, vicious dictator in the world, we stood up to him at the height of his power and we said no to him and uh, we fought him for the atrocities that he was uh, making to ordinary people. There are many stories and I try to shed light to some of them uh, as we go along and as I'm putting these vlogs together, um, as I said, for future and uh, for, uh, for the history to remember uh, what happened in Iran uh, almost 40 years ago. Um, I don't want the stories of my friends or would be lost. And this is not about me. It's about... A generation and it's about people that nobody knows uh, nobody knows about them but uh, they were they fought fearlessly and they were my heroes and heroines that um, had gone through so much of uh, pain but uh, they decided to say no to the end and they lost their lives and some of them are still fighting uh, against the Iranian regime, against the atrocities of the Iranian regime. And uh, many of us that we never gave up hope. We never gave up on Iran and to see Iran is a free country. Um, before, um, uh, I want to tell you about when I was arrested. Uh, I will talk about a lot of things later, but I feel that um, this particular video is about a particular night, uh, June 20th, 1981, things that ha that happened that night. But before I get there, I have to give you some perspective of, uh, of what was going on. So uh, from revolution, the time that was revolution, revolution happened, uh, 1979, 1980, we had some sort of semi-democracy. So in, that meant that we had newspapers, there were some newspapers that were published and uh, they were critical of the regime. And uh, we had some gatherings, meetings uh, um, in uh, various places uh, across Iran, uh, around the nation. But any, each time, um, it was met with brutal uh, um, plain cloth and uh, um, hooligans of the regime, those that supported the regime, uh, and uh, they started the street fights and they 
they wouldn't let us to have our uh, meetings um, and because they were afraid Khomeini himself was afraid of growing popularity that um, organizations such as Mujahideen or uh, the left uh, communist party um, they were they had they were getting a lot of uh, uh, popularity and uh, young people were very much attracted to them and they wanted to know about them Mujahideen in particular they were um, uh, slum uh, they they were Muslims but they were and they've been a modern Muslims so they don't they believe in a lot of values that I personally respect that uh, and to this day I still support them so I was arrested during those times, those uh, good times, almost good times, and then um, I was in prison uh, for about uh, six months. I was arrested in November 1980, and for a few months things were okay, um, sort of okay. We uh, had a lot more uh, uh, freedom uh, and there were more tolerance uh, you know but then uh, but now for us not knowing what happened outside of uh, the prison um, things were quite, very much getting uh, uh, harder and harder and the clashes had become uh, more and more every day and when I was in prison we didn't have um, newspaper radio tv we didn't have any of those uh, uh, medium for in order to know what is really going on outside of uh, uh, prison so we had no idea later on years later when i was reviewing the history back then during during those times that i was in prison i realized that during those times um, at least uh, 55 of uh, uh, Mujahideen supporters in particular were, had been killed in the street fights between uh, the regime supporters and uh, the regular supporter of this organization. So you can imagine that things were getting um, more and more um, harder between the groups that were trying to exercise their freedom and to Ha hold their uh, meetings, uh, programs, events, and at the same time to be critical to the regime. Uh, and Khomeini had absolutely no tolerance for that. Um, I was um, arrested in my house. So that's another thing. And uh, that, you know, I was a senior at the high school and I was arrested in my house. Um, a lot of things happen in prison, including that uh, one night in March 6, 1981, um, the, at the time the president was Abul Hassan Bani Sadr, and he had a, a um, speaking event that he spoke at Tehran University, uh, which uh, and he also had become more and more critical of the Khomeini and uh, not having enough power to uh, be the real president and do what he wanted to do, uh, what he thought is right to do during the, those times. Khomeini even was controlling him and uh, didn't allow that president even to do his job. So anyway, there was a big clashes between them. And uh, of course, anytime there was a big clashes outside of prison, uh, we were somehow uh, affected inside of prison. And because of that, uh, there was a clash inside of prison. And I, um, because of a lot of things that happened that will, that I will talk about it later. I don't want to, I don't want it to be the focus of this particular video. Um, so I end up uh, being in solitary uh, confinement, solitary cells. I was there for uh, from March 6 to um, mid, um, I would say to mid May, May 17 or something like that. And then um, they brought uh, some of my other cellmates that were in other cells, they brought them to my cell. My cell was about 
two and a half meter by three and a half meter at the most or maybe four meters at the most um, so it was a very small cell so I was there by myself and then there was a time that we were even eight or nine of us that lived in the same cell but at that particular time it was just four or five of us um, they brought four more uh, of my cellmates uh, and they transferred them to my cell uh, I used to be in a um, prison ward 311. 311 is a very famous uh, uh, ward in Evin prison. Um, everybody knows, those people that have been in prison, they know about the 311. Um, the 311 was almost at the beginning of the Evin prison. As soon as you entered the Evin prison, um, very quickly you could see the uh, 311 ward on your right and the headquarter of the prison on your left. Um, in one end it was a couple of steps and it was one uh, level story um, um, building uh, which was divided by uh, if you got in uh, on your left there would be a door and then when you open the door there were a hallway and there were three cells in there and then uh, in right in front of the main uh, main entrance on the opposite side there were two other doors and if you open those doors it was a s smaller hallway and in each time each part there were two different rooms in there so in, in total it was four seven uh, and with the three seven cell in one side and then uh, there was a wall and a door in between the building that um, uh, which divided the building in two sections in the other section there were two four more um, uh, cells in the way that i explained every two room uh, shared a very small hallway and it was locked by another door outside so um during those time that I was in uh, solitary confinement, I really didn't have uh, much of uh, visiting time with my mother. Um, almost when and every two three weeks, I would have like one few minutes uh, uh, visit with my mom, uh, but not much. Uh, maybe it would pass one month and then I would have like 10 minute visit with my mother uh, um, so after they brought the friends um, my other cellmates to my room um, it was in mid-May and uh, again we did not have any idea of what is going on outside of um, outside of the prison um few weeks after they came um almost uh, i would say around june 10 or maybe june 15 uh, i don't know exact i don't remember exact date but uh, it was in mid-june um that we had one um visiting hours visiting time with our parents and not everyone had it i was one of the lucky one who had the uh, visiting time with with my with my mother, and um, the significance of that day is that when I met uh, when I went to my cabin and I met my mom, uh, my mom was very serious and she looked at me after just saying hi and everything very quickly. She told me that things are changing outside, and you have to make a decision that you want to stay in prison or you want to come out back then during those times the only thing that the prison wanted you to do was to uh, write a letter and say you're sorry about what you've done and you apologize from the authorities and ask for forgiveness and then you would be forgiven and you would be free however our position was that we didn't do anything wrong so why should we write this letter so because of that we had so many argument and so many incidents that happen in prison just because of uh, writing this letter 
um, and we refused as a general it was 16 of us um, 16 uh, female uh, supporters of Mujahideen that we were in prison at the time and we refused to accept that we did anything wrong and write a apology letter to the authorities so that day my mother said you have to make a decision because from what we see and from what I am bringing the message to to you is that um, you have to make a decision that either whether you want to stay uh, or you're going to write a letter and you apologize and you come out but if you stay that means that you stay for um, uh, unlimited time we don't know when uh, you would be uh, released next so at that time uh, you know we were all around 17 18 19 i think the older the oldest person was like 22 or 23 at that time that age we had to make a decision that do we want to stand up for what we believe and our principles or should we give up and say mm, okay it's not worth it and i'm going to write the letter and come out and um, so when my mother was telling me out of her tone i knew she's very serious so i looked at her and i said um, what do you think i should do and she said i don't know this is your decision uh, but whatever decision you make i'm right behind you i will support you and then i told my mom i said i know that i want to stay and I want to pay the price for it, for what I believe. And my mother said, then I'm with you. Whatever you decide, I'm with you. And then at that time she told me, I had a cousin uh, who was my inspiration and who was my teacher, my um, master or whatever you want to call it. He was the one that introduced me to politics, to Mujahideen, to um, care about other human being and to fight for what you believe and fight for um, rights and human rights and, uh, and for uh, equality. Um, so my mother told me that he had got in as the visitors but he pretended to be the brother of my, one of my cellmates Nahid and she said she pointed out at the next cab cabin and said he's there if you want to see him go and then uh, I uh, immediately from my cabin looked at the uh, called my friend and, my, and she looked at me and I said uh, and she was laughing and she said he's here and she said we can switch so while our prison guards wasn't paying attention uh, we switched our place and I met my uh, cousin for the very last time um, and I told him and he also you know we were so happy to meet uh, each other uh, and uh, he told me uh, again he repeated it to me he said did uh, uh, your mom tell you about uh, what you need to do you need to make any decision and I said yes but I, I have decided and I know that I, I'm going to stay so don't worry I will um, I will uh, stay and um, I will be here uh, I believe in what we are doing and then uh, for the very last time we said goodbye to each other he put his hand on the window uh, the, because there was the divided by uh, glasses so he put his hand on the glass and I put my hand on the glass and we said bye to each other and that was the very last time I saw him a few weeks later he was arrested and he was executed or killed by the regime. His name was Hamid Reza Rasju. So we all came back to our rooms and um, back then we did hear a report, a, a message had came from outside of prison to all of us and telling us that hey guys hey girls you need to make a decision we don't know what is going on what is going to happen things are changing rapidly and um, we just want to let you know that if you want to leave 
you should write the letter, apology letter, and um, ask for forgiveness and come out. But if you don't, um, we don't know when the doors of this prison will be open to you guys. Uh, and each room we were talking among us that, okay, what is our decision? But all of us, although we were in different rooms and we didn't see each other because every four or five of us were in one room and the doors were locked, uh, we all decided that we are going to stay. Although we didn't know what is going on outside of prison, but we could sense that things are happening, but we didn't know what. And uh, but we knew that there are certain principles and uh, and prices that you have to pay for freedom and for democracy and for your rights. And we decided to stay put and um, not to leave. Anyway, a um, couple of days, a few days later, uh, June twentieth, nineteen eighty one. So we go, but we get to a night that I want to tell you the story about um it was late at night uh, we were all sleeping and then all of a sudden uh we heard a cry not a cry a scream of a woman probably a young woman and we all uh, woke up and you know we sat down and we tried to figure out where this no voice this noise is coming from and what is all about uh, we our room the way it was set we had no window or to outside of the we couldn't see outside of the prison so there there used to be a window that they had put drywall in it and they just left just um, uh, in the amount of one page like this opening on the left side on the very top so that way we could see that uh, it was day or night that's how we could tell the days uh, so um, that was the only thing the only space that we could see outside uh, and then uh, we try I tried a couple of uh, my cellmates um, they helped me to, you know, to jump in their, you know, hands and go, uh, stand out, stand on their hands and then try to see what is going on outside. And I couldn't see anything, but we could hear the, uh, the, the noise of the whips, the, the lashes that was coming, uh, you know, it was going through air and you could hear it and then hitting a body and since I had gone through that myself a few months before I knew exactly what is happening so I told my cellmates I said somebody is being uh, slashed it, the, the whips are coming to her body and we can I can hear that this is what's going on somebody is being tortured outside of the our doors um and uh, but we did, we were thinking what is this why uh, at this time of the night and uh, and all these screams and we were trying to figure out uh, and you know listen very carefully to see what else we can hear what else we can find out uh, a little while later um, we heard the very first noise that uh, that noise. Uh, that night was the first night that we heard it, but it became like our lullaby for the rest of our imprisonment because every night we would hear that. And the noise was like, um, imagine that a truck loaded of uh, rods um, are being, um, metal rods are being dropped on the ground all of a sudden. That kind of a, uh, um very scary noise um it was just like and then later we realized that this is a firing squad so for the very first time in our lives we heard firing a squad which meant many people were killed and we were 
trying to figure out we didn't know that night we didn't know this is a firing squad and but the nights after we start hearing it still we couldn't figure out what it is and later only a few weeks a couple of weeks later or a week later we found out that this is the firing squad and uh, it was very hard for us because imagine all of us were 17 18 15 16 i think the youngest at the time was 16 year old but that was our age and we were so innocent and we never heard uh, of firing a squad of shots and now we are hearing that and um, many stuff many things happened that um, it made all of us uh, to transform from that naivety to survivors to fight for our lives and try to um, at the same time that we are standing with our principles but we can leave the prison and then some of us went back to fight with the regime immediately some others like me came to left Iran and after that I started my my fight uh, against the regime and uh, many unfortunately had never had a chance to leave the prison and they were executed in 81 82 and some of my cellmates from 1980 they were executed in 1988 uh, which uh, the mass uh, massacre of 1988 happened so that was the destiny of uh, many of the young men and women of iran who there to stand up against Khomeini and the other mullahs ruling Iran and to tyranny of the, this regime and saying no to them. Only years later, when I was in Washington, um, I happened to find this and see this clip. This is from the day of... Uh, the day after the June 20th. So it's June 21st, 1981. And this is the Etelaot was one of the very famous uh, newspaper in Iran, like Washington Post, like Washington Times or New York Times, LA Times, that magnitude. They published these pictures, 12 girls. And I encourage you to go and search and look at these kids. There are kids. Some of them, they have no idea what is waiting for them. And most likely that night I heard, we heard one of their uh, cries or not, she wasn't crying, she was screaming. I wanna make sure because she wasn't crying and she was screaming because of the lashes that was coming, uh, hitting her body. Um, so I heard one of their voices. That night, they executed many kids, published their pictures without knowing their names. These, these are my hero heroines because these girls refused to give their names to the regime when they knew they were going to be executed. And that's what this regime is about. In 1981, we are talking about 39 years ago. These kids stood up, this, this generation stood up to Khomeini and to this regime. They put this on the cover and then they announced, it says, um, without knowing their uh, names, they were executed. And they asked their parents, if you see the pictures of your girls, come and get their bodies. This is how parents knew, found out about their kids. I'm a mother. I'm a mother of two beautiful daughter, daughters. And I cannot even imagine what the parents had gone through. That Imagining that they, first thing in the morning, they open up a newspaper and they see their beautiful daughters, the young, beautiful 
daughters had been killed, executed the night before without giving up their name and they have to go to claim their bodies. At the very same night, a prominent, uh, prominent uh, poet, very famous poet, Said Sultanpur, and this is his picture. He was a, a revolutionary poet, and uh, uh, and his uh, his uh, poems have been um, had been used before and after his executions um, in the many of the Iranian Persian Iranian uh, uh, musics um, and uh, songs. That was his. That day, it was his wedding day, and they arrested him. This is the only picture that is left for him, that he was dancing with his wife at his wedding day. He was arrested the very same day and very same night. He was executed with these girls, and the Iranian regime published these pictures of him. This is what happened to our poets. This is shows this regime, the Iranian regime, of their atrocities and why, why I still fight for freedom, for democracy, for justice in Iran. We are going to fight. We, we will never forget. I'm against uh, not only me, all my friends and, and people that I support, uh, the Iranian opposition that I support, we are against uh, capital punishment. But we believe that these people, the people that who committed these uh, atrocities and killing people, have to brought to justice in international courts, not even in Iran, international courts, and let the whole world to know what happened in Iran 39 years ago, 40 years ago. And it still is continuing to this date. These days, three young men that were arrested in November, uh, November of 2019 have been condemned to execution. They're young. They're exactly the same thing is happening over and over and over in Iran. And this needs to stop. And I see as, as a human rights activist, as someone who dedicated her life, uh, entire life, to fight for justice, for freedom, for democracy, for freedom of Iran, my beloved country. Um, I see it necessary, necessary to tell my story. This is not for me. It's for you guys to make a decision. It's for future to remember those people that we don't know their name. We don't know who they were, but they gave up their lives for justice, for freedom. They stood up to the Iranian regime from young age 40 years ago. So this is the story that I wanted to tell you about June 20th, 1981. And I will uh, talk about more uh, about uh, other days, other things that happened before and after, because um, uh, I feel that we have to talk. And I encourage everyone, whoever was in prison, also to tell their stories so we can create the picture of what really happened, what went, through, what went, uh, went uh, in Iran, that the whole world never found out what happened. Um, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, 39 years ago in Iran. And I, um, I, my, pl my dream is that one day I, would, I could raise enough money to make a documentary uh, about those uh, series of events. So stay tuned. I hope you listen more. Um, I will uh, publish other videos and talking about other things and I try to have some pictures so I can visualize it for you. Um, and let me know what you think. And um, if you have any suggestion, I'm open to hear it. Thank you very much for listening to me all this time. I appreciate it. And um, 
Fight for freedom and justice, always and everywhere.